like mm-hmm. walking out with like the water cascading off of him, tried it in hand. He looks powerful. He looks strong. It's like, yes, this is the king of Atlantis. <laughs> seven seas, baby. Like, come on. And even I think Nicole Kidman, Nicole Kidman's line right after she's like, "Yes, the one true king." And I'm like, "Yes, yes, it is." I was like, "No him, no him." Um, That's right. So like, that was a really hot moment that I was pleased to see. Um, I also really enjoyed seeing the audience. guys welcome back to another episode of another relaunch i am keenan what's up y'all i am lz how are you doing this week LZ? you know it's been a week oh no. okay it's a good a week or a bad like, week i felt weird i yes. actually feel like you say that every week <laughs> i know right as <laughs> well because like um i ended up in like kind of a car accident what yeah i like so like I'm a very good driver, first of all. Never got into a car accident. And it's not even like an accident, accident like that. I was like going down this uh, street and there was oncoming traffic towards me. And I was mm-hmm. trying to get into this parking spot. And um like the oncoming traffic towards me was like there wasn't a lot of space. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay, well, if I can just like squeeze into this parallel parking spot right here, I'll be mm-hmm. fine. And like everybody else can keep going everybody's cool. I'm in my spot. Well, I try to do that, but like I clip the car <laughs> behind oh. me <laughs> that I would like, that I was trying to like squeeze into. Oh, it, was no. a, it was like a brand new BMW. So like oh, no. that happened and I was like, great. And then I am already like at the point where I'm like, I need a new car. So mm-hmm. now I'm like, just like speeding it up. But this is the sign. Well, I'm glad it wasn't like super serious and you're okay. Yeah, I'm all right. You know. Then who would I have to talk to comics about? <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm speaking scared. of, let's go ahead. Well, yeah, so we're very grateful for that. Um, but let's go ahead and actually get into these comics of the week. So we'll start up with Catwoman Annual Number One. This is from Ram V, and we actually had like a few artists on this issue. We had uh, Federico Blanco, Kyle Holt, and Juan Ferrer. Um, so this issue was kind of just dedicated to the villain that Catwoman's been dealing with in Alley Town, who's been uh, tracking her. And we get into his backstory a little bit, and we see that he's connected to the DC hero Azrael. He is the, like all about like God. He's very divin- uh, divin- divinity, excuse me, and like he has a flaming sword, which is who doesn't love a flaming sword? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really hot. So we just kind of get back into them and like their history, how they know each other. It's again, it's a Ray V. Catwoman issue. It's good. I don't, I don't really know what anybody expected me to say about the issue, but um, I don't know if you remember from the last issue, I told you this villain like had one of her friends and he left him bleeding and dying in an alley. Yeah. He's okay. He, okay. he pops back up in this issue. He was found in time and like Catwoman comes to the hospital and she sees him. And he's trying to tell her. He's like, oh, I told him kind of about you. He's coming after you. She's like, don't worry about it. She's mad, but she knows she's not looking for this guy. She's upset. He's hurt his friends. The villain's actually really kind of cool. He talks about his relationship with God and how all of these people who he looked up to as father figures kind of let him down. Then he ends up jumping off a roof, but he doesn't die and he comes back. He's like, you know, when I was in pain and I reached out for you, you didn't say anything and that let me know it's all about me and like I can be the God. And so that's why he's going around killing people. And I kind of am always into people being crazy about the church. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think, you know, I just, I don't know. I really think those are interesting characters. So I was all about this issue <laughs> and this run. Again, I think if you're not reading Catwoman, it's something you should definitely pick up. Do you feel like this annual was like the typical annual that is kind of like an out of story, story, <laughs> or, do you, or is it like necessary to can, can read with the, uh, what's going on in the rather issues. Um, no, it felt like the typical, you can kind of skip it if you really wanted to. But I think just to get that backstory on the villain, you should. Nice. What would you rate it? Um, a four out of five. I think a lot of the guest artists service the story well. Uh, I really like Ron Ferreira's art. I actually wanted him to do Moon Knight. 
He and oh. Ben Percy they did like a Moon Knight story in an annual, and I really wanted that creative team to continue. So it was nice to see him back here. Uh, Federico Blanco has been the artist for the run who's just been killing it. And uh, Kyle Holtz, I wasn't too familiar with, but he was fine. Okay. I'll definitely check that out, y'all. Get you some of that cat okay. That's good. Um, next up on the list is Shang-Chi number two. And it's from Jing Luan Yang and Dyke Ruin. Um, you, you didn't pick this up, right? I did not. You know, I've um, I've had my feel with the streets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Well, you're missing out. So, as you know, Shang Chi is now in charge of his father's organization. Right. Um, and everyone. I will say that that mini was pretty. It was good. The, the mini was good. Um, yeah. and so he's kind of trying to change the way the organization works, but obviously they're still criminals. So in this issue, he gets invited to this auction, which a, with a bunch of other supervillain groups. So like Aim is there. Um, yeah, yeah, right. You love Aim. She comes in back <laughs> now. <laughs> Um, but you see a lot of folks and they're kind of reacting to Shang-Chi like, oh, you're here. You shouldn't be here. He's like, no, this is who I am now. And there's this new villain. Um, she uses fans. She is Lady Bullseye of the fan. That's what she calls herself. OK. Um, and she has Lady like, Bullseye or is it like a new character? She's a new character. Okay. Um, but she also has a romantic history with Shang-Chi's brother in this issue. So she's in charge of the auction. And they, uh, the first thing up on the list is a cosmic cube. And so. Shang-Chi, everyone's kind of bidding on it, but Shang-Chi makes this really high bid. And then the Hand, who is also here, make an even higher bid. And everybody's like, why the Hand trying to, uh, you know, send that much money? We know they're cheap. <laughs> but they're like, <laughs> <laughs> like the Hand, and like uh, Lady Bulls, I even said, she's like, you know, there's a cost for people trying to bid out of their means if you can't pay for what you're supposed to. But they talk <laughs> about how they apparently have somebody who they just acquired funds from so they can pay for it but in the midst of all this captain america pops up into the uh, auction and so again all, all the people are like oh okay <laughs> everybody's like oh shang chi you call captain america we knew your line but shang chi's like no and so then him and captain america actually start fighting for the cosmic cube shang chi gets it um he basically makes it so that the captain villains didn't ask me. <laughs> but you know him and shang chi face off a lot though like they're they're like the two who you want to fight because I yeah. mean, Man. come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they're doing that, but after the oh, so what happens is the villains chase Shang Chi and Captain America to this place, but we find out that Shang Chi used the Cosmic Cube to make it a trap, and he actually did call Captain America to come get this Cosmic Cube <laughs> because he's like, you know, I get it who I'm in charge for, but it's still a Cosmic Cube. And uh, Cap, Cap takes all that, but what we don't know is his bro Shang Chi's brother had grabbed it before, and he changed it so the villains got away. And he actually still has the cube. So like Captain America walking around with the fake. Um, it's another good issue. It's kind of just putting Shang Chi like against the Marvel universe and putting him into this new role to solidify him. The next issue, Wolverine is going to appear, and they're going to fight because Shang Chi is going to find out he has yet another sibling, and this one's going to be a mutant. Oh. He has so many siblings. They're, they're popping <laughs> up. Papa was a Rolling Stone. Hey. <laughs> hey, no um, judgment. I definitely rate this like a 3.5 out of 5. I think Dr. Wood's art is really, really what, good. Um, the action scenes are perfectly rendered. The story's fine. It's got, like I said, it's kind of, you kind of get what's about to happen and what's going mm -hmm. on, but it's still enjoyable to see. That's nice. I like that they're really trying to cement him back into the. And you obviously with his movie coming out, that's mm -hmm. important for them to do right now. Uh, but it's yeah. good that they're like really taking them up there. Yeah. So that's fine. And next up on the list is another fun comic book, Beta Ray Bill number four. And this has art and uh, writing from Daniel Warren Johnson. And the colors are from Mike Spicer. Now, Beta Ray Bill is that guy. OK, um, you know what? I'm not going to lie to you. I I myself am not the biggest fan of Beta Ray Bill. But like every time this book comes out, my entire like Twitter timeline talks about how great it is. <laughs> it's hot. Yeah. It's hot. And so it's like, and it's just like really good because I guess you don't really get to see Beta Ray Bill that much in this type of super personal setting. So when you do, it's like really fun to see because he's a likable character. But that's again, I will say this about as I've gotten more into Asgard and Thor and Enchantress and all that, 
the characters on Asgard are really fun and they're really likable. I don't think I've come across anyone who I'm ever like, oh, I don't want to read about this person or oh, why are they on the page. I've only ever gone into a saying like, oh, you seem interesting. When I finish like learning about this person, I'm going to go back and do you next. Um, <clears throat> And Beta Ray Bill is no exception to this. And so I think this issue is really nice because it's a look just into his history a little bit. Scuttlebutt has again taken on this humanoid robotic form. They are trying to find this sword that's going to be able to help Beta Ray Bill transform back into his Corbinite form. And they've been attacked, their ship has been attacked by this like tentacle monster. And it's got like tentacles all throughout. So Scuttlebutt has a a uh, room full of memories of Beta Ray Bills, like things she's just videoed and recorded of him throughout the years. So the uh, monster has tapped into this base and is basically uh, causing Bill to relive all of his experiences. So we see like when he was first transformed, um, we see like the first time he fights Thor, we see a uh, time where the last time he saw his mom, and it's just like a really nice little quick look at him and getting up to date on his history and it's a lot of emotional beats with scuttlebutt she's kind of trying to tell him you know you are enough you are constantly like searching for this thing to make you great and make everybody see you you are here and beta ray bill was like yeah i don't feel that way <laughs> and so i know it's like really sad <laughs> um and so they get to it uh so finally they uh are able to find the monster's core. They destroy it. They get to the place where the sword is. And this is when Scuttlebutt's trying to have that conversation with him. And Bill's just like, no. He's like, I have never seen myself as like this great person. I don't think I am like amazing. I don't feel like I shine bright. I need this sword to help me do that. He grabs it. Sertor returns. <laughs> and everybody knows that is the big monster who like calls the Ragnarok and who killed all of Bill's people. And so he's like, this ch is the chance for him to also come back. And so I guess they're going to fight next issue. Mm. OK. It's hot. Bill versus Surtur, OK. Yeah, it's real, real hot. Uh, another 3.5 out of 5. Only give us like a little bit lower, just because, again, it's a pretty straightforward story. But the, no, I, 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 no, let me give this a 4. Because the emotional beats were there. OK. Like, it was hidden. OK. Like, like, it was hidden. It was hidden. Like, seeing Scuttlebutt and this new relationship that she's forming with Bill and how he's been with his ship the entire time. It's, she, and she even says it. She was like, I've never seen you or felt this way about you before. I have always just been your ship, like just this non-feeling thing. But now whatever's happened to me, I realize like the appreciation I have for you, the love I have for you, I care about you and I see how bad you're hurting. And like, I just want to help you. And Bill is just like so down to his own self-loathing that he's kind of like, no. Um, and then you have Scourge and Pip who are on the side just trying to be his wingmen and also help him. Up. It's just a nice story about people helping Bill. It's great. Oh. Everybody should read Beta Ray Bill. It's a great book. Next issue is the last. It's only a mini series, it's five issues. Okay. Um, and so <clears throat> next up on the list is Daredevil number 33, and this is Chip Zdarsky and Mike Hawthorne. Now, I know you are reading this. I am. Yes, I am. Um, because. Yeah. I may have had my fill of the streets, but not too much. <laughs> <laughs> There's always room for Electra. Um, and this book, again, like, has been really great. I know that everyone has been kind of uh, recommending this series, uh, like, in the beginning to me, and I was late to the, to the pickup. Um, but now, um, now, like... You're in. It's so You're good. In. I'm in. <laughs> I'm so in. We get um, more of Elektra as Daredevil, um, uh, and she's like basically bringing the fight straight to uh, mm -hmm. this woman who is, I can't remember her name, uh, Izzy uh, something. I can't remember her name, but she's like the main uh, kingpin right now. And uh, she takes the fight directly to, to her. We also get some of Daredevil while he was in prison and he kind of goes to the uh warden of prison and attacks him and the warden is like what are you doing this is going to get you like in so much trouble and daredevil's like i don't care because I, I need to make sure you know that what i'm here for and uh and you're not gonna <laughs> okay. you're not gonna change <laughs> this out of uh, or like try to have me killed or whatever we're gonna do this the right way so that was pretty good to see um the art is great there was that little girl that Electra was kind of training in the beginning, but she like, I guess, kind of pushes the girl too hard to some, in my I opinion. Mean, like, I'll get up <laughs> because she's a child. That would be. 
I mean, she, at some point, you got to get up. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> she was training this little girl who, like, I think her mom died because of the whole null thing. And last issue, she shot someone. And it turned out to be a hand ninja. And this issue, she's kind of, like, dealing with the trauma of it and feeling like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't want to be a part of this life. And Electra's like, don't worry about it. It was just a hand person, like, you're going to be okay. She started freaking out. Mm-hmm. Electra's like, get up. Like, mm-hmm. let's stop crying. Let's do something about this. And the girl is like, no, I don't want to. So she runs away and cries mm-hmm. leaves. And Electra does not run after her. She's just like, I hope she stays tough. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and that's what you would expect from Electra anyway. Exactly. Which is fine. <laughs> All the way. Um, yeah, so another great issue. Bullseye is on his way back. Obviously, there has to be some kind of matchup between Electra and Bullseye. Uh, but this time, she'll be Daredevil. So we'll see what that's going to change as far as how she feels about wanting to murder. Have they had like a single one on one fight again since that time he killed her? Yeah. A couple. I mean, like, like a really big one. Yeah. Where they and killed her, one of just killed the other one. Yeah, I think she killed oh. him. Oh, good for her. Yeah, they fought like a couple times, and the next yeah. time she fought, she beat him. Do you like that feud? I did, but sometimes it could be it's getting to be a little expected. You know what I mean? Is it like, like, is it a Road Carol thing now? Kinda. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit, where it's like, I get that they should be in, I, but I don't want them to be friends, obviously. Yeah, well, yeah, no, I just mean in the sense of we just know exactly how this is going to turn out. Exactly. Or anytime, you know, Electra shows up, you know, eventually Bullseye is going to show up and they're going to fight. Okay. It's kind of like, um, you know, in Mortal Kombat with Sonya and... Um, oh, Kano. Kano. It's like, oh my gosh, we always are going to have that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I would give this issue though a solid like 3.5 out of 5. Mm-hmm. I was into the story still and very into the art. So yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, I'm not gonna lie. I think I might take a little break from Daredevil. Oh. Okay. Uh, just just because there are some books that are about to come out that I also want to add to my pool list, so I gotta switch some things around. Okay. And Electra's cool, but I know she's your girl. <laughs> <laughs> But can you say that you've at least enjoyed Electra more than you have before? Or oh, absolutely. Before? Absolutely. Absolutely. I will say that, like... Oh, I just being the murder kill girl. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she um, she's getting a lot of depth that she needed. We're adding some layers to the character. Um, I just, again, I think the type of character that I've come to appreciate and really, like, enjoy the most... That's just not the type of character she's going to be. No, no. She doesn't get your prepare. Exactly. And so, she's cool, but... <laughs> she I'll <does>. wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, next up on the list, Black Widow number 8, Kelly Thompson at Elena Casagrande. Now, this book features the doll. It's Yelena Belova. Mm-hmm. And... Kelly. You know what? I get it. <laughs> you get it, right? You get yeah. it. Yeah. You get it. I didn't really, I didn't really get it before, but I get it now. You get it. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, and all the people who are listening who are also coming to this realization and also joining in on this party, welcome to the Yelena Belova Stan Club. <laughs> I am the president. <laughs> yeah. But I welcome you, um, and so. Here in this issue, we have uh, Yelena and Natasha, and they're talking. Uh, we have the whole mystery of this guy who kidnapped the young girl who they rescued, who's giving people superpowers. But at the end of the last issue, we saw that one of the villains who he gave powers to ended up dissolving. So now they're scared that it's going to happen to the girl. So they're just trying to find this guy before all of that happens. Through this, we get a lot of poignant moments between Yelena and Natasha. And Natasha talks a little bit more about the family that she had in the first arc that she lost. Well, they're not dead, but she had to get rid of them because obviously they were liabilities. So she faked their death and sent them off somewhere that she'll never know about, um, which I thought was really nice. And I like that Kelly is making that a point to remind us that she did live all of that. 
and she still has those feelings and she's not yeah. just she's not just like moved past them and again like the spy world takes its toes on people um and with that we also see that she's now well at yelena's word has now created a little group of spiders in one of those <laughs> yeah. spider <laughs> one of those spy girls is spider girl on your corazon and she's running a mission for them trying to figure out more about this guy now i also really like this issue because here we go with a murder cult what else do <laughs> okay when we got when when spider girl was you know doing her whole spy thing and was going into this place as mm-hmm. soon as I saw the murder cult, I was like, oh, I'm sure Kenan's enjoying this. Like, I like you just sat up. about I to was sacrifice like, something. Yeah. This is what I'm here for. I was like, see, this is why you can't leave the street. This is where you get the good stuff. Um, <laughs> and so uh, it was nice to see her in action, too. Like, and adding Kelly. Again, like, the way Kelly adds kind of these obscure E, D through, like, z-list characters and gives them just like little bits but the bits still feel impactful it's great um and you still get a lot of personality from her i will I say like that she establishes like or like not only establishes new relationships but like re-establishes relationships because mm-hmm. you know uh spider girl and black widow they've had a thing yeah. before yeah yeah um, where Spider Girl was like, this is so cool. She went out with a Spider Woman too. I think they went on like a a mission together, and she was like, mm-hmm. "Are we like the Spider Girls or something?" <laughs> <laughs> and she, I thought that was really cute. So like to bring this back around now and to have them mm-hmm. still like work together, I think is cool. And it like moves them forward. So it, it it's fresh. It's again, you're not seeing Natasha with Iron Man and Bucky and uh, Hawkeye like you always have. It's like these mm-hmm. are the people who she also knows. And she's letting them get in and get close to her in different ways that she never let those other people do before. So I think that's really cool. Um, I will say what I have realized about this issue is that um, I'm not really a fan of the way Thompson ends her books. I always feel like like I'm missing like half of a page. Like I get to the end and it's kind of like, oh, this is it? Like I stopped? It's just like, oh, that didn't really hit me the way I wanted it to. Or maybe maybe they just leave me alone. And, and I get it. It's a cliffhanger. So I guess it's supposed to make you feel like, okay, now I need to know what happens. But I never really stop and go, oh, I need the next issue. It's more so like, oh, this issue's done. I yeah. <laughs> you know what? The more I, I stop and think about that, I can kind of see what you mean. Because the Captain Marvel issues kind of end like that, where they end and you're like, oh, wait, that's the end? <laughs> and... Yeah. But it's it's still a cliffhanger, but like not one that is so on like a big emotional high or whatever that you feel like, oh snap, mm. that's I have to come back to the next one. And even I though like you're gonna come back to the next one because you like the story. Yeah, and I feel like the way this issue ended. Um, so uh, basically, what happens is Yelena goes out to try and find out some information. She ends up getting kidnapped. Natasha actually makes a comment about how Yelena's probably loved the fact that she got like chained up by the villains because she gets to fight people and she's very excited. And I was like, I was like this ain't me. I don't know. <laughs> I was reading this and I was like, oh my God, this is awful. I was like, and this even, is a book for me. Even the whole Black Widow when she jumped in and uh, Yelena was like, you didn't have to come here for this. And <laughs> she was like, now you're just showing off and stuff. I thought yeah. that was really cool. Yeah, like love oh, that. Oh, but she face and she was like, you. You were the one who tied me up. And and like, yeah, this <laughs> you know, yes, I was like, this is my girl. Um, but, you know, the issue ends with one of those guys. He kind of grabs Yelena, and I guess he electrocutes her. Uh, well, he does electrocute her, and I guess. But he does it in a way that it looks like it's in her brain and, I guess, her heart. And so as I was reading it, when I realized we're at the end, I was like, oh, we're at the end. And then I had to go back and, like, oh, she might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it didn't hit me as hard either because I just assumed she wasn't going to die. Exactly, right? It was just like, I guess maybe that's also a thing. It's just like, you just know that she's going to be all right. So, but whatever. Still a good issue. Really great book. It's a great book in general. It's one that I don't feel like we're talking about enough, honestly. I agree. People need to definitely be talking about Black Widow a lot more. It's a great like, book. This is, a, this, is, this is the run that Natasha needed. She's had a lot of books. She's had a lot of books. And they're always kind of about the same thing. Like, she's on the run. The government doesn't trust her or the people don't trust her. Like, the red room or the red room yeah it's like you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just like we get it <laughs> um, so again i think this one does a really good job at kind of read like i said revisiting and reestablishing relationships putting her in a new way 
getting her to do some new stuff. It's great. Kelly might, Kelly's got She's it. She's doing it. She's doing it. She's got it. All right. What would you uh, rate this issue? I would actually give this issue. I don't know. I would give this like a 3.5, almost a four. I want to say a four. I really enjoyed it a lot. Like, mm-hmm. um, Elena Casagrande has become one of my favorite artists right now. And I really enjoy the way that she, like the fight scenes and the way that she like has the movement between like the panels and everything, I think is really good. So I think it's, it's 3.5, but like four leaning. Okay. I would I would I would go with a 3.5 only because like I just said about the endings they kind of leave me a little bit underwhelmed. Um but I think the book itself is very solid. I think the characterization is on point. I think the art is amazing. Like you said Casa Grande is like super talented. I would like to see her on something else. I know, I think she's done a lot of street level work before. I would like to see her on something a little bit more superhero-ish. I want her to draw um a Wonder Man relaunch. That's what I want. Okay. <laughs> so next up. <laughs> next up on our list is cable number eleven. Uh, this is by Jerry Dugan and Phil Noto. This is the last issue, yes? One more, I think, after this. Right? Oh, okay. No, yeah. I thought this was the final issue. Oh, I thought it I thought it was gonna go to twelve. Oh no. No, yeah, this is one issue. Yeah. Oh, there's one more? There's one more okay. after this. Um, because the way this one ends, like, it's definitely another one after this. Um, this was, I know you're not reading this because it says, like. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no, no. I would never. Yeah, no, I know to say, I know to say. And I started off with this book because I'm not the biggest cable fan. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really like him at all, actually. But I'm always looking for new stuff for, like, to convince me of otherwise. Like, if it's a good book and maybe I end up walking away differently with a different opinion on the character. Cool. Um, and I do like Phil Noble's art. Um, but this book was all about basically the return of old cable. So uh, young cable has old cable resurrected at, uh, in on Krakoa, like through an egg with the five and everything. They put mm-hmm. his brain back where it's supposed to be. And, um, <clears throat> and, he goes off and picks up magic because he's basically going to have a whole like fight against strife strife has been collecting all these mutant babies because he's going to do some kind of ritual yeah strife is nice strife is fun he's a fun villain (laughs) he's going to sacrifice these babies kind of like in infernal to basically bring a whole nother like demonic thing to earth and uh cable basically has this like space station where he sent like kid cable and they're up there talking about how this gonna be them versus Strife and how Kid Cable's gotta go back to his own timeline. This book has a lot of the things that I don't like in it, like time travel and, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and Cable, but I tried to see if I was gonna like, like some other stuff in it. It's kind of fun, but, and the art's cool, but whatever. I might stick out with it now because like, it's only one more issue. I might as well write it out now, but, it's it's whatever. Okay. Well, he was in it. it. Made, I mean, uh, Deadpool made an appearance in it as well, uh, because mm-hmm. obviously you can't pull cable without having Deadpool somewhere close. To um, I respect that. So, yeah, it was I. Right. I would rate it a oh. three. Okay. Shout out to Cable. <laughs> um. <laughs> all right sorry for the cable uh, fans out there i wasn't i do think i like kid cable way more than i like old cable oh okay that's a distinction yeah i like, do because I, I feel like a lot of cable fans have not liked kid cable and so i feel like if you really weren't a cable fan you might enjoy kid cable more i don't know i think so I don't he's fine he's fine he's uh you know just out there trying to live life and make the timeline right. Whereas old cable they should have called Haggard. Wi-Fi. Say it again. His nickname should have been Wi-Fi or his code name. Oh, that would have been cute. Cable yeah. and Wi-Fi. <laughs> 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 and he's yeah, young. 
Um, okay, well, next up on the list is X Factor number 10 from Leah Williams and David Valdion, and this is the big ending of the Hellfire Gala. And what an ending. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> what what an, an ending. Let's talk about it. Um, did, did you read this? I did. I know, oh, okay. I did. You, everybody know that I don't like the writer, and I don't like his series, so, like, uh-huh. whatever. But I did come back for this for Hellfire Gala. Uh, mm-hmm. Because like the ending of it, so I wanted to come back and see. And who knows? Maybe the writer had gotten better since like, um, the, since I had left. But that did not happen. This book was trash. Okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that being said, um, so in this issue. It is the ending of the Hellfire Gala, and we see the team of X Factor getting ready. Um, we see a couple of them, you know, Polaris and is getting annoyed by Eyeboy, who's like skating around the house and everything. They meet up with the five, they teleport there together. David kind of says, Who's Prodigy? Uh, he's kind of says that he's forgot something back at the Bone Jar, which is the headquarters, so he's got to go back and get it. We end up following him to a bar and we kind of get the backstory. So it was said early on in this series that uh, did, Prodigy said he believed he died and he just couldn't remember how. And so he got a package and it had like a phone in it and a costume and he had left breadcrumbs from himself. We find out that he had went to a bar, he had been tracking down a serial killer who had been carry, killing black uh, queer men. And David kind of set himself up as bait. And I guess this guy did succeed in killing him. And, but he goes back to like confront him and the X Factor team, uh, Aurora, Nor- uh, Dokken, and iBoy come in to help him. They end up locking this guy up. And then we go back to the gala and we see that iBoy has called, what's that boy's name? Think fast, Speed. <laughs> and to like surprise David with. And as they're walking, we run up and we come across the dead body of the Scarlet Witch. Now, there was also some think, uh, like something weird because I saw different pages for the ending of this book. Did you? Yeah, so like the page I had was like Speed and Prodigy and iBoy and them like standing over Jean's dead body. But I saw another page online not that Jean. was, I mean, not, it was... not Jean's dead body. <laughs> <laughs> Wanda's dead body. <laughs> you know, same girl. Um, <laughs> the, but uh, I saw another page online that had like Jean and Beast and Wolverine and Cyclops looking over Wanda's dead body. And yeah. like Wolverine Did was asking. That no, that wasn't in my issue. Oh, that was in my issue. No. Hold on. I'm about to go back and look right now. It was like an, it was like an after credit scene, kind of. Which I thought was actually kind of cool, like to have that after credit scene, um, because after you finished and you saw uh, Speed and all of them and Prodigy see Wanda, the book kind of ended, and you have a uh, like the this is on next week, and then the final page was a. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, I don't. I don't have that page. Comicsology about to give me my three thirty nine back. <laughs> That's crazy. I wonder if there was like a uh, a special or something. Maybe it was a glitch. I'm gonna I'm gonna delete the issue and re-download it. We'll yeah. see if that. I'll do that. Let us know, everybody, if you guys got like the extra scene. Cause, Cause I'm about to get pissed off. <laughs> 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 um, but so all that aside, how did you feel? That, well, we know how you felt about the issue. But um, what makes you feel as though <laughs> that the issue was trash? And I know that a lot of people had some controversy around Leia's use of Prodigy. And so if, for those who don't know, um, there is a real life situation of a man by the name of Ed Buck who was linked to the killing of a few black gay men out in LA, I believe. Yes. Um, his trial was actually this week, last week? It was just happening. Yeah, yeah he got like, arrested back in 2019. Like the whole, yeah. like all the rest and all that came out like two years ago. Yeah, but he just had a trial very recently. So she was pulling some real world references for that. Um, how did you feel about everything? 
That is the part that really like bothers me the most because in my opinion, if you don't have the if you don't have the experience to write about something, then just don't do it. <laughs> like, um, but again, Leia has always struck me as the the ally type, which mm-hmm. is uh, I am. I think I'm doing everything right by doing this, even though you're not like listening to people or you're you're overstepping where I think you are trying to place your goodness mm-hmm. or where you're trying to place your help. So like, in my opinion, you linked the prodigy's death to a very real world situation, which again, I was out here like while the murders and all that stuff was happening. And what Ed Buck was doing, he was basically getting young black gay men who were either homeless or they had moved to LA to pursue some kind of dream and they were down and out looking for something and he would get them and just get them on drugs and like watch them shoot up and he would just watch them shoot up and die Mm -hmm. and to have someone try to like make a real world situation reference with that but to have it then where all of all of all of prodigy's agency was taken out of it because his like white teammates had to come in and save him because he couldn't do anything there and then you try to like have some random cute moment of iBoy doing like Naruto hand jutsu stuff to mm-hmm. do like blast him. I thought that all of that was whack mm-hmm. and unnecessary. Yeah, I agree. I think um, a lot of the agency was taken away from Prodigy in the story of what should have been his. And then even so, like giving Aurora and Dak in their like cutesy moment while they like actually have the body of Prodigy on his back. Talking um, about how it turns them on. It was just, it was it was just weird. Um, and I will say that I do feel like a lot of this also came from the abrupt ending of the book. You know, apparently it's been said that she didn't know it was going to end, so she tried to wrap up a lot of storylines. So I could say that maybe that's why it didn't get the time that it needed. But I also feel like if you knew you couldn't give it the time, maybe you shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and and why even if you were going to spend more time on this. What would she have done differently? Yeah, uh, but and so, <laughs> and I think that part is where I get a little iffy on because I know Teeny Howard has done interviews that people want her to kind of like talk about Monet's racial ambiguity, ambiguity, and just like delve into that. And she made a comment where that she felt as though she wasn't in the place to tell stories about people of color. Like she feels like those should be best told from those people, and it's like. I feel like there has to be some type of good middle ground. Mm -hmm. You, um, like, I don't mind that Leah tried to tell the story. Like, no, not at all. Cool. Like, you tried, but again, you have to be able to actually, like, tell that story. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Um, So it's like, I don't want anyone who, like, wants to do that type of thing to feel like they can't or it's not their place. No, because right now, honestly, they don't have the voices of those people in the ex office. Exactly. Those I know like black gay writers for this, someone else would take on that on that world uh-huh. story. So So it's like, okay, cool, somebody's gonna try, but then it's also it's like, yes, but then you still need to go out and look for those people as well. So you can get those more authentic voices and it's but it fits. Um but I think as an issue it was a little subpar. I think as the ending of the Hellfire Gala, I felt as though it didn't go off on a high note. Um, the death of Wanda, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it's whatever. You know, we all kind of feel we know what's coming. So whatever, let's just get her done. Let's move on. Honestly, like, that's kind of why I'm okay with, like, the tri- this whole trial of Magneto thing, because we all know that, like, is all going to end with her being a mutant man or or not whatever way it goes but like i'm kind of over it all just like <laughs> whatever gets me wicked to krakoa mm. that's where i'm at whatever gets me quicksilver to krakoa i want that yeah he's cool too mm-hmm. but what would you rate this issue i'm gonna give this issue um um mm, uh I'm gonna give this issue a one out of five. Do not, oh, do not, damn. do not recommend. Okay, 
Damn. Um, I was gonna give it a two. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think I think uh, David Baldion's art, while it's not necessarily for me in terms of like facial structure, I think the way he sets up a page is really amazing. Uh, I don't really understand a lot of what Ivoy does. And I didn't really understand the whole like power of magic and Naruto thing either. I actually asked on Twitter if someone could explain it to me because I've only I picked up the first four issues of this book, um, and then I picked up nine and ten, and that's it. So I was like maybe somewhere between like five through eight, he's done something like this before, and I got about fifteen different responses about what he did <laughs> <laughs> and how he did it. <laughs> so whatever that's that um but i think the way baldion draws it is nice i think the way he like would draw them kind of talking to each other it was cool um but yeah two out of five for me okay <laughs> and the last book on our list is Eternals number five? This is Karen Gillen and Isad. Now let's now let's turn it all the back around. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> now we're turning the ship around. <laughs> <laughs> because this is where. You know, so again, I think we've discussed like before about becoming Eternals fans now, but I, I'm still kind of I'm still on my rocky boat. I don't know if I'm actually an Eternals fan or if I'm just a fan of this version of the Eternals. Yeah. Like, this is going to be like my immortal Hulk for the Eternals. <laughs> but I don't know. I do love Cersei. She's That's high. She's high. So um, in this issue, again, we are trying to find the traitor in the Eternals camp who uh, has helping Thanos and, like, kill the, uh, what's it called? The life machine? The death yeah. machine? They call it, like, the machine. The machine. I like the life machine. They, they, they have uh, destroyed, sabotaged the machine that's supposed to help the Eternals come back when they're dead and someone's now going around and killing Eternals. Um, so we see like Cersei, she's talking to Tony Stark. She tells him a little bit of a lie so she can lure Gilgamesh out. And Gilgamesh is also a former Avenger Eternal for those who know him. And Gilgamesh was everything in this issue. Gilgamesh is my kind of guy. <laughs> um, I love a little moment between him and Icarus where <laughs> Icarus is like, you know, uh, after they kind of like trap Gilgamesh down, he has some people who have their guns pointed to the rest of the Eternals, and that's uh, Cersei, Kingo, Athena, Icarus. And but like Icarus says, none of them are pointing your, their guns at me. And Gilgamesh is like, yeah, that's because I want to beat you down myself. Yeah, I was like, that's my guy. Um, and so watching that was, interaction was, was like really that in the Avengers. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't really remember too much of Avengers from that. I think I need to go back and reread it, actually. He might, maybe I do like the Eternals. Maybe yeah, I, I back remember. I think Cersei was also on that team around then, too, because like, that was back. It was like um, Black Knight, too, right? Mm-hmm. I've been, yeah, I'm going to go back and do that. Um, so we go through there. Um, we kind of end up finding out that That's the also traitor might be. A fight against Exodus, by the way. You'll see that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's we'll see. Um, we kind of take the Eternals back. And oh, well, before we even do that, we find out that uh, Icarus is like, well, we know that Icarus is protecting this little boy named Tony. And they're currently with Sprite hanging out. And Sprite's got the boy skipping school. And they're just talking about death and life and killing people and all those things. I'm really interested to see what's going on there. Yeah. But get back to the machine. Gilgamesh kind of shows them how the machine would be sabotaged. And he lets them know, like, the only person who knew this was Fastos. And so we discover that Faustos has done something and he is in fact working with Thanos to kill the Eternals. And he I wasn't expecting that. I won't lie. It's always the black guy. <laughs> now see. <laughs> if it ain't Alex Wilder, then it's Bishop, then it's Faustos. Oh, we wow. We can't win. Damn. Well, I don't even know how to say what to, what to say. <laughs> I forgot about just can't and the fact that it's Bishop. <laughs> well, what does that say? <laughs> say about us. <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we need to look within. <laughs> um, but but um, to be fair, 
I see more going on with this Fausto situation than him just like betraying the team. So I, I would not be surprised if he was like using Thanos or like trying to do some, something no. with the machine. I don't know. I could see it being bigger than just all the Eternals gotta die. Yeah, yeah exactly. So something like that. Remember, even they even did it to uh, Calder and Young Justice, even though his was fake, but still. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, stellar issue really into the Eternals the art I love Rubik's art on this again Gilgamesh was probably my highlight this issue I hope he sticks around for a few more because I'm enjoying that a lot yeah Gilgamesh was great I really enjoyed this issue uh, the whole fight between uh, Gilgamesh and Icarus was cool to see I liked when they talked about how all of them have similar yet different powers like all of them all you have telepathy. like telepathy to some degree, but like I forget his name. Uh, I forget which one is like he's the the better one at it. So I do like that there's like differences between their powers and stuff. Um, the whole beginning where she used Tony Stark <laughs> to like lure him out was really mm-hmm. cool. Cersei, she does give. I'll give her that. She does. She's a good. She's a good. She's the doll. She's the doll for sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm definitely rating this a, um, a 4.5 out of 5. Agreed. I would do that with you. I really enjoyed this really a lot. Time. And kind of like you said, though, I am not sure if I've become an Eternals fan where I want to go back and read all their old stuff and, like, you know. With the future, I don't think there's time. too much old stuff to read. That's true, yeah. Cersei, so, yeah, she's been around. Because as yeah, she said in this book, around. She likes the humans. Who else is she supposed to sleep with? Yeah. <laughs> <She's> like, <"I laughs> <get it." laughs> Girl, the doll. Um, but yeah, so we'll see. Uh, I'm. I want to go back and read one of their books, but it has J.R.J.R. art, and I'm not a huge fan. Me neither. That's so cool. we'll see. We'll see. But I will also rate Squad 0.5 out of five. That brings us to the end of the comics of the week. Let's take a little break, and then we'll come back for a very special panel. I know somebody's very excited. Notice all the green if you're watching. <laughs> You've got a lot of green. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> all right, everybody. Welcome back. We are here for another panel. And this week's panel topic is something very special. For those who don't know, um, the new X-Men issue is coming out this week. Mm-hmm. And it features a brand new superhero team of X-Men featuring Cyclops, Marvel Girl, Sync, Rogue, Wolverine, I said Sync already, and Polaris. Yes. Sir. Oh, Sunfire is also on the team. I was like, I know I'm forgetting somebody. And um, I said Marvel Girl. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right. All. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Um, and so for this, you know, Mr. LZ wants to come in and talk about his girl. Yes, I know that is right. So I want to do a panel for Polaris because um, I hadn't done one on her yet. And I wanted to do some background on her because this is her time right now. You know, it's um, her moment. She's joining the X-Men this week. Um, I have never <laughs> seen so much fan art of Polaris than I have ever. in the past <laughs> Like, ever. ever. Okay. <laughs> Tell her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is new. Um, and I'm loving it. Keep all that fan art coming, y'all. Anytime y'all want to uh, tag me in it, please do. Um, but yeah, I wanted to come up on here and talk about Polaris and give a little bit of her background. Just kind of talk about well, like what I see in her and why I'm excited for her to be joining the X-Men in like, this next phase for her. Um, so like... I actually got, I think my first introduction to Polaris was in Magneto Dark Seduction. So like this was like an early 2000s book um, when I first like was introduced to her in like the current like time. And uh, because I think my dad had given me some books to read before, but they were like the Dark Phoenix Saga and stuff like that, but they were older, but he had his own pull list. <laughs> and these were the books that were coming out at the time. So my first introduction to her was in Magneto Dark Seduction, and she had just joined up with him on Genosha. 
And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, this girl is dope. Like she's got the same mm-hmm. power as Magneto, but like she's a girl. <laughs> I'm into it. <laughs> I'm, I'm into this. And um, and I just thought uh, like her story was kind of cool. Like the way that she was presented as like being as powerful as him, but really trying to like learn her powers and kind of learn what that does, but also kind of being excited about like the the potential mm-hmm. of what her powers could do and like what it would mean to join up with Magneto. She's always been kind of very pro mutant. Um, so that's kind of what got me into her in the beginning. And then I just went from there and really liked her, but never really like put her as my top, top spot until I went back and did like some deep dives on her and realized that she is the type of character that I like and like the versions of Jean that I liked to like, she was like a fave of mine, was Polaris all the time, (laughs) whereas they were only Jean like some of the time. Um, Mm -hmm. So like that assertiveness, that like very pro-mutant and um, and honestly like kind of living in that in between where it's I'm going to always protect mutants and our cause but like I really just want to sit down and I I want everyone to be able to chill yeah and that's (laughs) very my vibe so (laughs) (laughs) I ended up just really liking her and once I did that deep dive I was like oh this is the girl and uh, that would happen like a few years ago now but uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> um, no, and so, so for, you know, anyone who hasn't realized by now, LZ and I have known each other for a while, and I think when we first kind of started talking and talking about faves and everything, like, you were very Miss Marvel Girl, okay? Yes. That it was, was very specific. <laughs> it was very specific, like, you did not enjoy the Phoenix, it was yeah. like, no, I like Jean and X Factor, <laughs> I like her. <laughs> here there uh but you know that was always your girl and so i remember kind of when the polaris shift started a little bit i don't i don't remember what story you had just gone back and read or like you had just caught something but you were kind of like i think i like polaris a little bit more than i thought i did (laughs) and i was just like oh okay yeah i was like I, i was like that fits i feel like you know knowing you i was like that seems more like your character and then just watching it kind of just snowball <laughs> to like it became this thing and it was just like no Polaris and then it was just like all the time we just started talking you know we used to have talks about our favorite characters and I would do Betsy or Aquaman or something but you had you know Gene and Waterman and then it was just slowly but surely it was like well you know Lorna could do this and, that. and I was like okay this is becoming like a thing and so it's like watching that grow like wow what a moment mm-hmm. yeah. yeah a moment truly pleasing to me. I will never forget it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I think what happened was, like I said, I had always really been into her and she was like top two, top three for me up there with like Sue and Jean. But then like the more I read into her and the more I read, the more I read into her and I saw stuff that was like, Jean also was around. <clears throat> I realized that, oh, this version of Jean is actually who she is, which is like, you know, she is, more compassionate and leads with her heart and um, cares about stuff and is really all about Scott and like they're gonna be together. Um, That is not what I'm about. (laughs) You know, I'm off, obviously I'm always off for compassion almost to a fault. And I think that Mm -hmm. is something I actually end up resonating a lot with Lorna where she has these attachments to like her family and Mm -hmm. her people she loves who she, follows no matter what until she figures out maybe I shouldn't have to go that far. And child, if that ain't me, I don't know what is. Uh, So I like really ended up just really kind of relating to that story. Who have been, so who have been your favorite writers of Lorna? Um, definitely Pad. He has been great. Mm -hmm. Um, he had that, the X Factor stuff that he did with her actually He's done the most stuff with her, now that I think about oh, it, really? because he, he took over for her for X Factor Volume 1, which I still think is, like, one of my favorite runs of hers. Um, and he took over that book, I think, in, uh, like, issue 70-something or like that. It's, it's when the whole team shifted and when okay. it became Havoc, Lorna, instead of the original five. Strong guy. 
strong guy. Yeah, that's um, and he did some great stuff with her there. She was very like um, into her powers. I mean, the the book opens with her <laughs> looking in a newspaper for a job mm-hmm. because she was like, you know, I don't have money. Like, I got to get my own money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's okay. I was like, okay, girl, you want? She was like, yeah. Some of us don't have like rich friends. Like, I gotta do what I gotta do, and um, so definitely, Pat has done some great, some great stuff. Mm-hmm. And then again, he must be a fan of hers because when he was in that X Factor Volume Two run, I think it was Volume mm-hmm. Two or Volume Three. Mm-hmm. Again, he brought her back into the fold when she kind of left space with Havoc and got back. He put her back into the book. So it's always kind of interesting to me because norna has been around for a very long time. But she never really popped off as like uh, Claremont. Let's be real. Most of the popular Lady X Men were written by Chris Claremont. Like yes. they're the they're the Claremazons for a reason. Uh-huh. Uh, he never really, I guess, tried to make her one of his like core girls, which is strange because she seems like he she'd be right up his alley. You would think so, right? But like I don't know what it was about her that like he didn't really like. Mm-hmm. But at the beginning of her story, like kind of getting to her origin a bit, she was introduced yeah. as like, the mistress of mutants. She was supposed to be like the the queen of mutants, like the heir to Magneto, basically. And this is back in like with Stanley and all of them doing this stuff. So like um, <laughs> everything was kind of black and white then. Like it was these were the villains, these were the heroes. So she was introduced as supposed to be Magneto's daughter. She's kind of a villain. She um attacked and beat the x-men <laughs> and then she uh joined them excuse me she uh joined them later because of course you know she wanted to be a hero but then it turned out that that magneto who said was her father was just a robot and in my opinion i think that, that was kind of done just because she couldn't be a villain if they were going to keep using her back then versus now mm-hmm. <laughs> clearly <laughs> what we have going on now <laughs> um so that kind of happened, and then when Claremont came in, she was still kind of with Havoc at that point, mm. and I don't think that he saw too much of, like, changing that, because, again, her story was she wasn't really trying to be in the forefront. Like, she just wanted to mm. actually leave the whole, like, superhero thing around. She was always very mm. pro me, but she kind of didn't want to become, like, an adventurer. She wanted to go to school and uh, move out west <laughs> and get a degree in geophysics and just chill with with oh, Havoc in California. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, like, I think he may not have been too into her because she didn't want to, like, that character wasn't, like, a in-your-face type of character. Whereas he did lose, he mm. used Havoc. Obviously, we saw him use yeah. him, you know. And he brought her back around because, you know, we bring this up all the time, but, like, Storm is a powerful character, and who's she going to fight? <laughs> so... He did use her, you know, with malice and all of that. Yeah. So he recognizes yeah. that there's something there in her. And he he did some fun stuff with her as malice that she definitely showed up how powerful she was against who else is strong enough to take on Storm. Yeah. She lost, but yeah. like, still. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. Uh, so yeah, he um, saw some stuff in her. He also was a part of the uh, just to even jump forward with her her origin like after that whole ordeal with malice and she was kind of mind controlled and was leading the marauders she tried to break free from malice and then uh the whole you know that girl you like <laughs> that thing happened and she had her powers taken Which by um, um zaladane <laughs> oh yes yeah. yes yeah. zaladane her <laughs> sister that don't even that yes. doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, like that whole thing happened, and she had her powers taken, and they switched. And Claremont kind of used her then during the whole Mirror Island saga, where Shadow mm. King broke out, and the way that Shadow King broke out was actually through Lorna because her powers changed. He, I think, maybe he just liked flying brick characters because during that era. Uh, she Isn't got that the where old, he changed her power? Yeah. She was no longer mm-hmm. the Magnus. Uh, Zaladane took it. She had the... She, like, took on your negative emotions of the people around her, and mm-hmm. it made her strong. Yeah. Like, physically mm-hmm. strong. He should have used Necro. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, okay, that's that's strange. Um, and then but I, I think I remember a little bit. Ignite about that uh, not only took away like the Shadow King stuff and fixed it, but um, like I don't know how it worked, but like her powers came back after that too. Like everything got fixed <laughs> after that in the Mirror Island saga because you know comics. But uh, yeah. yeah, after that, then she joined the X Factor that I was talking about with X Factor Volume One. So right. she's been around. Yeah, I mean, she's. Been, I think my thing about Lorna is she's never really been the most popular character, but and I, this is true. For, I feel like for a lot of characters across the Marvel line, there are some people who are just always going to be around, no matter what you want and no matter yeah. what you want to do. And Lorna, being the daughter of Magneto she's always going to be around. She might not be a star, she might not be like at the forefront the entire time, but as long as you have Magneto, you're always going to have like some form or some variation of the House of M. Currently, Lorna is his only like true biological child. So even if he does get Wanda and Pietro and all of them back, like regardless, you're always gonna have a House of M. Lorna is a part of the House of M. She's good. She's always going to be good. As long as you've got Magneto there, she's going to be great. But I think what's great about her are the moments kind of outside of that, because she's learned a lot from him. After she came to Genosha with him, uh, she learned like a lot about her powers and everything. Um, I think that's why I'm so excited to see her on this X-Men team, because I'll finally see her like away from Magneto and, and doing um, some stuff. Yeah. We'll see Magneto. I don't even got to bring up. Is there, is, anyone in, <laughs> is there anyone in particular on the team who you're like really excited to see her interact with? Um, I think honestly, honestly, probably all of them, really, because like I think really? she hasn't interacted with a lot of them a lot. I would really like to see her have like a cute buddy situation with Wolverine. I think that would be cute. I know they've interacted before where they've had a fastball special. I think that would be cute. Mm-hmm. I expect her and Jean to get along, but I've always thought that their relationship would kind of be like, you know how you have friends that you went to high school or college with, or like that you met like freshman year of college, but like Mm -hmm. y'all not friends like that anymore because we both have been through different things, but like, you know, that's, we shared that moment. That's your home. Yeah. Yeah, that's the kind of relationship I expect them to have. I can see that. Like, yeah, girl, we've had an orientation like <laughs> yeah i can see that i mean i'm i think i'm kind of excited to see her interact with i guess rogue and sunfire again because i remember them from the whole like austin milligan transition of x-men and then like her and sunfire were uh horsemen of apocalypse together so it'll be interesting to see if like we pull any stuff from that but um i don't know i mean i'm excited to see what she can do you know i know a lot of people talk about lorna what are the lorna feats <laughs> and so <laughs> she you know, got <laughs> and I do I do feel like this will help a lot of people who don't know about Lorna who don't want to go back and read all the old stuff, like to get to see what Lorna can do. Now I will admit, I will admit that mm-hmm. <clears throat> while I am a big fan of Lorna, a lot of the times where she was written well or things were done great for her, it was not good for everybody else in the book because uh people don't like the austin run myself included but i will admit that like the austin's run did do some good stuff with Lorna. now she did go like kind of crazy at that wedding with uh havoc when he was marrying annie but like you know hey she had just dealt with the whole genosha thing Mm. like she was feeling away i mean (laughs) (laughs) she saw her she saw her being like Going to go get married to somebody else. She was having, and she had a, a moment. Okay, it happens. And after that, though, she, which I, I wish people kind of kept reading the the Draco, which was not very good, but like <laughs> it was good for her. Um, she had a therapy <laughs> session, and during the Austin run is actually when it was finally confirmed that she was the biological blood daughter of Magneto. Because again, like I said in the beginning, it turned out that that Magneto was a um a robot so it was always just kind of left up in the air and never really confirmed but during this time she brings up how uh she was on genosha took a blood sample for him when wolverine like tore a magneto spine 
And she took a blood sample during that time and actually had it looked at. And Xavier was kind of helping her through this trauma. And they had like a whole therapy session. She (laughs) was being a little petty and invited Annie into this therapy session. Mm. Um, (laughs) She kind of showed her a memory of her and Havoc, you know, (laughs) doing the do to show her, you know, hey, you know, does this bother you that Havoc used to love me? (laughs) And... (laughs) (laughs) So then and after that, she ended up changing the the scene and they see how she was actually like Magneto's blood daughter. So that was confirmed then, which was nice to see. Wow. Um, but seriously, right. I feel like because it was introduced that way, everyone just assumed it was, even though it ended up with it just being that robot. I think people just like. That's what um, have they ever shown her mother? I don't think I've ever seen her mother. Yeah. So her mom is you. You actually see her mom for the first time later in Pad's run. So it was always a thing that she was um, in a plane crash. And that's how her parents died. And you never saw her parents before. And she was raised by, um, like, uh, uh, she was adopted, like foster mm-hmm. parents. Um, but then her her parents were, her mom, his name is Susanna. And that is the one she cheated on her husband <laughs> with Megan. Mm-hmm. You find that out later in Pad's run that um, she was during that actual plane crash. Mm-hmm. Um, her mom was actually having an argument with Arnold Drake, who is um, who like Dr. Polaris and everything like how they got together. And he was saying like he was he was anti mutant, and mm, of course. Susanna was like, no, like I love mutants and like you know very pro mutants, like they deserve to have their own. Come on, Susanna. Which clearly makes sense why she, (laughs) you know, and then like during that, it also came out that that plane crash was actually caused by Lorna. Her powers manifested and um, like there was a big electromagnetic pulse that went out and Magneto ended up coming to that crash and finding Lorna still survived. But he was like, how could this even be possible? Like she died in the crash too. He assumed that she put like a, a... force to herself or something to protect herself which he was like you know she's too powerful right now which makes me realize that xavier did the same thing because he had a uh, mastermind change her memories so that mm. she, uh, magneto was there or that she caused that plane crash xavier loves changing some memories right that so is like his now that like that- his special move Seeing that Magneto did this to Lorna and Xavier did that to Jean, it's like, hmm. Man. It's got men. <laughs> it really ruined Ooh, this. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Do not recommend. <laughs> Do not. Do not recommend. So, yeah, wow. that was finally confirmed then, and then we finally got some of her parents later in that pad run. Um, I will always highly recommend the War of Kings era. Um, I know some X fans are not the biggest fans of like space and all that stuff, but she was like on a planet out there. And again, yes, she was helping Havoc <laughs> because they he were needed star jammers. They were star jammers. Yes, was having a great time. time. I really like the star jammers. That was That's fun. a fun. Yeah. Um, I like the X. Yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, pretty much exactly that. Um, what are you hopefully hoping for in X Men and Lorna? Like character wise, do you want a specific story? Do you want? Obviously, I want her to be able to flex as much as she wants to with her powers. Story wise, I really want now that, um, and I hate to use her as like the the litmus test, but like now that Jean is also on this team with her. I hope that it can kind of show the differences between the two of them because too often have like people said that they're kind of the same in the beginning or like, you know, it's Mm -hmm. Lorna is just Jean Grey with green powers or something like that. Like, I think that their characters are so far different from each other that maybe now that they are near each other, you'll Mm -hmm. see that, you know, uh, (laughs) Lorna's know a lot more about that action. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I do think that she's just a lot more willing to jump into the fight and mm-hmm. and get her hands dirty, and she's not willing to back down from a fight mm-hmm. if, if 
if it's presented to her. Um, if it's if it's a question of, oh, we're going to talk this down and de-escalate first, she's going to fight first. <laughs> you know, not kill in the beginning, but she's like, we can just fight about it. I can Which relate. Is, is like, again, but she's also still really compassionate and cares a lot about the people she loves and uh, her friends and everything. So she really designed rides in that middle. And a lot of mm-hmm. the great things I've ever saw with her was those earlier issues. I would actually, maybe this is kind of what I want to see from her. Mm-hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not now because she doesn't maybe need it. Even though I think everybody needs it. But she used to go to therapy after mm-hmm. the malice. Her therapist was Doc Samson, uh, mm-hmm. who was like a uh, Hulk related character, and she would go to him um, and have therapy sessions and stuff and and do that. And it was nice to see her like get more into her character. We see more mm-hmm. stuff about her. She talked about how um, she didn't want to go she she doesn't always feel comfortable with her body but she wants to flaunt it off she's mm-hmm. like um, you know i want i'm okay with showing skin but like i'm also uncomfortable and her therapist uh Dr. samson said you know have you ever found it interesting that you have the power of magnetism to push and pull and that's exactly where your character lies is that you're always in the middle you push people away but you also want to pull them in at the same time so mm-hmm. i think that like Anytime you ever want to kind of really get into Lorna's character, it's really that. It's the push okay. and pull. Okay. She's like, leave, she's like, hello, but like, I want y'all around at the same time. Okay, I can respect that. I get that. Come on, hey. you better convert the people. <laughs> so, this Lorna Day. She's coming. This is going to be right. a lot of fun with her on the X-Men. Um, Although I will say, I, I, I've come across a lot of Lorna fans on Twitter. Yes. Like, like they're, they're, I think you guys are a very quiet group, but... Mm-hmm. You're out there. I mean, obviously, she won the X-Men vote. Listen, just like Lorna, we mind our business, but we there. (laughs) (laughs) I respect. respect. Did you watch um, The Gifted? I did. And... Mm -hmm. Because that was very (laughs) Lorna. It started off all right, and I think I was just excited for, like, X-Men content, and Mm -hmm. the interpretations for Lorna were decent like sometimes they were right other times it was like what is this you know the baby thing was weird yeah yeah that That was was weird weird. like like they had her also have like random angry spouts which felt more wanda than Mm -hmm. her green wanda i do remember episode i think she like destroyed a plane or something so that was nice to see they let her be powerful she was very powerful in the show i will give her that um i also didn't mind the effects with with her, I do think that like her hands should glow green mm-hmm. um, while she's using her powers. Um, and if it's metal, probably shouldn't glow. But if she's like manipulating magnetic fields or something, or mm-hmm. she class, I like the green energy stuff that that they were using for her. How would you feel? How do you feel about her new costume for X Men? Child, so like in the beginning, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, uh-huh. I didn't like it because she was in a skirt. <laughs> What's everybody got against green skirts? But I will say it's better than that green skirt. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know the more I, the more I thought about it and looked at it, and I got a commission of it in as like shorts. Mm-hmm. And it's like so it's like more of a kind of a romper short thing. Mm-hmm. And so I like it a lot. And okay. if they if they were to ever change it into shorts, it would actually end up probably being my favorite costume of hers. Mm-hmm. So you like Lorna in green costumes? I don't mind it, but it has to be a situation like this where it's like black and green, mm-hmm. you know, and it's not, it's like downplaying a lot of the green versus the monochromatic green on green. Save okay. that for like her, we'll call that her House of Them costume. Like that is okay. something she's on when it's, you know. I like that little original purple outfit she had with the bat thing <laughs> and the, and the, the lace. The, the stockings too. Is yeah. She yeah, that was a hot girl right there. <laughs> that was, that a, was that a hot, hot girl. girl. You that know, it's actually girl. a great again, a great era for her, but not for everybody else because she actually came over to the X Men and really uh, set her personality mm-hmm. and differences against how the X Men view things versus how she is, and she really showcased that like, no, we shouldn't always just be trying to like assimilate and stuff. Mm-hmm. We should be able to be out and be proud as mutants. We don't have to like hide in the shadows. Let's attack instead of just sitting here. 
I respect it. You know, that's, yeah. that's what I'm with. And I'm hoping I get a lot more of that energy. She looks like she's going to be, obviously, in her cool girl era during mm-hmm. using her powers and stuff. I do appreciate that she showed up late, obviously, with this coffee or something, because that mm-hmm. is... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, are you with the potential of Wanda coming back to the House of M? Are you ready to see them interact again? Uh, yeah, actually, I do like that because as much as I say that Wanda ruins things, which she does, I do yeah. like her around. She's fun, and she that's my <laughs> you know. But that's her power. Her power is chaos. She's just the embodiment of it. So that'll be fun to see them around and have an interaction again. Again, I don't want her to be like besties. With her, with her. I don't mm. think it's to be like, oh my gosh, my sister, my long lost sister. I hope that we are always together. Did but I, it's, um, it's good, whatever. I didn't think, I w- what I would have loved for to happen with them too is like if Wanda had went through the crucible, I would have loved for Lorna to have been the person she faced. I feel Ooh. like it would have been a very nice little kind of ending to their story as just a Wanda trying to find her redemption and like do all of these things. And like obviously, when it comes to the house of M, Magneto sees her as his daughter. Um, Pietro is never going to have anything bad to say. Wiccan and Speed are never going to have an issue with her. To really be accepted and to have like family and to be the whole thing, the only person who needs to kind of come around to Wanda is Lorna. And I think that a yes. Lorna, Lorna having been affected by Wanda in House of M, and right. to also be the one to like now look at Wanda and be like, you took this away. Now you have to prove it once again that you're worthy of it. And like, you have to come through me, this person who you took it away from. And I just think it's a very full circle moment. Ooh, I actually really, really like that a lot. I would, um, you know, we had talked about the redemption of Scarlet Witch before, which, hello, yeah. I don't know if they're listening. <laughs> 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 because we definitely just talked about that. And I think that. Um, having, I think we talked about them going through the Crucible as an option mm-hmm. and having Lorna be the one who Wanda pays off with would be great. Magneto would be too it's expected, like whatever. whatever, yeah. And, then and it's I like think also, there's it's, panels of like Magneto killing his daughter. It's also like Magneto's two girls, like the, the quote unquote favorite daughter versus the quote unquote like other. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? It's like here again, once again, you're like looking for your dad's affection and all this other stuff in in two different ways. It's just I, I, I maybe I just want them to fight. I think them fighting would be like a very good story. I actually think that would become full circle if they did have that crucible moment and she was there because you did make a great point. That, um, by the way, everybody, yes, <laughs> during yeah. House of M, uh, Polaris was affected during that too, and she was one of the people who lost her powers. So That's kind of what caused her to go over to Apocalypse and try to get them back as a, uh, she was a horseman for a bit. And having that kind of full circle moment would, I would like to see it. Yeah. I think I should get some commissioned art of it too. I think that'd be great. Get it like of her, of like Wanda beat down and bruised. Mm-hmm. And, like, and you gotta like make moment. Like she gotta like earn it. Girl, get up, yeah. fight. Yeah. Like get up sister. Ooh, <laughs> <that's hot. laughs> oh yeah, that would be hot. Yeah. That would be hot. Yeah, I think I'm really excited for uh, Lorna in this next era. This is really going to be a lot of fun, I think. It's going to be a fun year for her. Mm-hmm. This is it. I I I feel like she hasn't had like this, her moment yet. I was going to say, she, this is this will truly be like her make or break thing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, to see if Lorna... Like, again, she's always going to be a character who I think is always going to be around. She is the house of M. Um but to see if she hits that like next tier of character who pops off the x-men kit role now you know yeah like if if this might be the thing that decides if people will start to include her in their x-men fantasy lineups that's the one you know? it'll that's be like oh need. let me have let me have polaris on my team because like that's what you need and, and she's got to be good it looks like who? We don't worry Emma. about Emma. <laughs> that's who they're going to have to kick off. You're going to have to start kicking somebody off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She doesn't do anything, so you can get rid of Emma. They love a girl who can fly. Oh, yeah. And that's some Lorna. All her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. her. <laughs> She's my dude. This is, I'm excited for you. It took a lot of work to get here. I had to make a lot of calls. So 
you know, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember yeah, I would I would tweet you randomly and say, please put in a good word because it seems like anything you ask for seems to come true. Now, I will say though that um, it seems as though any of your things they have a monkey paw with them because <laughs> now while I do get lost in the X Men. I don't know how well <laughs> the trial of Magneto is going to be written. <laughs> so, you know, that, 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 that is always true. It's, it's, <laughs> it's good. You get a little bit of bad, but you kind of just learn to wade through the bad. and get, It doesn't last for very long. That's what I will say. Mm-hmm. And the good right now is definitely outweighing the bad. And when it's good, it's fantastic. I love it's it. like, it's like, no, it's like, what else can anybody say? Listen, I had said before that I felt like the Krakoa era was kind of clicking down. Now I will say that it's kind of still true, but <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's more for me personally. It's more like individual books for me aren't that mm-hmm. great, but the Krakoa era, like as a whole, for real, is like pretty still pretty great. Oh, um, amazing! This is this is legitimately a golden year of X Men and to X-Books, be an X fan. Yes. The X books have never been as good, especially in the last few years after every, after the MCU and all that synergy taking yeah. place and the way they got knocked back. The X-Men have never been as good as they have been. Do you remember X-Men Gold? <laughs> Actually, no, I don't, because I didn't read it. Do you remember Extraordinary X-Men? Oh, now that was bad. That was a bad <laughs> time. Like, they really tried to put the Inhumans out there. Yes. Like, they really tried it. And, like, it, it wasn't even subtle. It was not subtle at all. And then what made it so bad was because they did it, but, like, everybody was offended. Even if you didn't really care about the X-Men, you were just still kind of like, all right, this is a bit much. What bothered me was, uh, was that they would always try to lie and be like, it's not about um, the rights <laughs> or anything. We're just focusing on a different team right now. It's like... Like y'all literally have created a cloud that is going around poisoning mutants while creating the Inhumans. And sterilizing them. What? <laughs> well, look, wait, but you see what happens when you do clownery? <laughs> It always comes back to bite. This is what, it I, tell them, this is what bite. I tell people when they try and when they try and like go against Betsy. It's like don't do that. Mm. It won't work out for you. I mean, look what happened. This is this is how kind of how I feel with Lorna. You know, we mind our business, but you went against her with this LS X Factor run, and now what happened? Mm. Can mm-hmm. now she's on to the X Men. <laughs> 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 I love it. I love the it. The girls, the girls go through some tough times every now and again. And I think again, and this is just this comics as a whole. Like, the fame is gonna have some blow moments. It's cool. If they're if they if they are good and they have a place, they're gonna stand the test of time. Don't sweat it. Mhm. I agree. You know, I I will say that I would like to see Lorna actually interact with Betsy. Betsy and Frenzy are two of the characters that I think that she would actually get along with the most. Her and Frenzy had interactions before, obviously because the whole acolyte thing. But like, um, I think that they would be. I can actually see that. I can see them getting along. They actually kind of have a lot in common. Mm-hmm. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Look at that. Um, <laughs> and I think well, the only time we really had them together, well, Muir Island Saga. Yeah. They interacted a little bit, and then. The uncanny X Men disassemble, but like that was wasn't really big on character. That was an action movie. Um, yeah, I'm into that. Yeah, I would like to see them like I, at the next like event, maybe Inferno. Maybe we see more of that then, because obviously she, um, Betsy's gonna be in like Otherworld doing whatever, and Lorna is gonna be off the X Men. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see what happens over there. We'll see. Yeah. Well, all right, let's take a break now. Um, thanks, y'all, for, you know, listening to this Polaris panel. Uh, please, if y'all, any, any other player stands out there, interact with me on Twitter. Um, if y'all want to talk about her, I've got all kind of special panels and all that kind of stuff. I need to update her beats list because it looks like that's about to be <laughs> getting a, a, a nice little update. Uh, well, let's she take definitely a- going to fly. Oh, for sure. And taking down something. It looks like she's stopping a telepathic thing, which is wild because Gina's standing right there. Well, so what's her name? 
Right, she's with her man, so. And he didn't tell her to move, so. <laughs> Let's take a break. <laughs> Let's take a break. <laughs> Da-da-da. This is the art. Oh, for the, I guess everyone can't see this if you're just listening. I was holding the art and making of Aquaman in my hand, and the, the forward is by Jason Momoa himself, and the introduction is by James Wan, and it's written by Mike Avila. I bought this after the movie came out. I love it. It's great because we are doing another rewatch of <laughs> da, 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 Aquaman. Uh, he doesn't have like a theme song. He kind of have a theme, but like I don't know how you mimic those things with your voice. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, outrageous! You could yell outrageous because the Brave and the Bold Aquaman used to yell outrageous, and that's actually probably one of my favorite interpretations of him. Um, really? Yes, it's fantastic. Okay. It's like it's truly, it's truly like the Arthur at his core, heroic, optimistic audacious, like, loud, fun-loving, happy, good. Like, he got his wife and his kid. He ain't mad about nothing. That's, that is all Aquaman has ever wanted, to, like, live a quiet life with his girl. <laughs> <laughs> okay. He is just like, he's like, I truly don't want to yeah, he's like, I really do not want to be king. I really do not want to do a lot of this stuff. Like, I just like to help people. And if I could do that just by, like, building homes in my neighborhood, I would just do that. But unfortunately, people keep telling me I got to rule this nation. So, (laughs) I mean, that sounds like exactly the interpretation of him they did in this movie. Like, they (laughs) they wanted to, now they sometimes took it to a bit of a dude bro extreme sometimes with, with Momoa. But, like, I think they were just letting Momoa be him. Uh, but mm-hmm. that seems like the right interpretation of Aquaman they did in this movie, which is nice yeah. to know. You know, I so I, when I first got the like Blu-ray DVD of this film, I used to watch it once a week. <laughs> so fun, I, I actually saw this. I, I actually saw the movie in the theater five times. I went to All a right. Thursday. I went to an early Thursday showing. Then I went Friday opening night. I went on with a group of friends that Friday. I went on Saturday with my boyfriend at the time i went on sunday again by myself and then <laughs> i know that's right the solo <laughs> <laughs> and then i had uh, uh another friend who was like in town and then we went to go see it on monday night it was great you know what? that's and that is what you're supposed to do when you are standing for your faith okay, <laughs> okay. and you know it, it, it took me, I was a little apprehensive, I remember, about going into the theater and watching this, because for those of you who do not know, I am not the biggest fan of Jason Momoa and his acting. And, and when it was first, like, rumored that he was going to be Aquaman, I remember just, no. <laughs> I was like, I don't believe it. Um, then when that first image came out, for BVS and it was like him holding like the sword and he had his little dreads and everything and I was just like yeah no I'm still not really feeling it that much but I kind of convinced myself that like Jason Momoa was a cool guy I, I understood what they were doing like Aquaman had this reputation as kind of the laughing stock the useless member of the league right. Jason Momoa is very much the antithesis of all of that he is pure adrenaline masculinity all the things that you want to see um and I guess your heroes, and so they want to take it to that extreme. Which I was like, okay, let us do that for BVS, and then again, by the time we get to Aquaman, we'll get something different. I will say that James Wan did do something different. Like you said, a lot of that Jason Momoa-ness was still in there to give you the dude bro feel, but there were a lot of times where I felt like they're really trying to get the essence of Arthur and Aquaman, and like who he represents and what he's supposed to be. Um, I think going back and watching this, I was pleased with how much I still enjoyed it. I remember... Yeah, that's fair. (laughs) (laughs) I remember, honestly, after we watched the Snyder Cut, I was saying I kind of really wasn't excited for the sequel. I didn't think I would go and watch it because, you know, again, Mo and the acting. But going back and watching this and seeing a good interpretation of Aquaman, I guess, 
or a better interpretation of Aquaman. And like the movie itself is very fun. There's tons of colors. There's an explosion every few minutes. Like the action scenes are pretty great. Uh, they're very well choreographed. Seeing Mera use her hydrokinesis was fun. The big ring of fire gladiator stuff. Uh, Patrick Orm, I mean Patrick Orm, Patrick <laughs> <laughs> Wilson is Orm. You can tell he's having like a really fun time doing this. I will say though that the acting was still a little wooden mm. from a lot of people. I don't, know how, <laughs> I don't know how much of that like fell on the script or just maybe the cast and the lack of chemistry. I remember distinctly reading interviews from Amber Heard where she talked about kind of her annoyance with. Uh, Jason Momoa on set she used to read a lot of books and she would say that like in between takes she would come back and there would be pages like ripped out of her books or the books would be gone and it was Jason doing it <laughs> and I was just like a big man child a big man child so I feel like maybe that kind of had like some things to do with the chemistry that they had on the film but other than that like as a whole it's just a very fun thing and I'm excited, and it reminded me, again, it ex- reminded me, like, what a better interpretation looks like, and it's like, oh, okay, if this is kind of the energy the sequel might give, but, like, improved, I might be there. I like the movie a lot more than I was expecting to, um, mm-hmm. because, you know, DC has a, a reputation that speaks for itself <laughs> as far as the films go. So I wasn't really holding out too much for the Aquaman movie. And then with the casting choices, I was like, okay, this is just going to be whatever. But honestly, like, this movie really gave me, like, everything that I like about a superhero movie. And rewatching mm-hmm. it now, this time around, I was like, oh, wait. Because I hadn't watched it in a while, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, this is kind of, like, fun. Like, they have, like, all the superhero moments that I like. I really, really enjoy the way that um, the director shot the like fight scenes, um, specifically mm-hmm. like the opening fight scene with um, Queen Atlanta in the beginning, like the way that the camera kind of follows her. I really like that. Really loved the um, Italian fight when Mera was running through Italy and they were like running through that building and stuff and, and all that. that. That was excellent. I got like really excited during that part. Yeah, I was like, this, it looked, and it felt like a comic book. Like it was like, you felt like you were going mm-hmm. through the panels of a comic book. So. I really enjoyed all the action pieces there, um, and people really put their all into those. Um, again, it was just some of the acting was just. It was just, you know, <laughs> and it's I've, like, I've said it's it like before. I don't I... expect, like, you know, Oscar an Oscar worthy. No, you know, I don't expect all of that, but damn, like. No, it's like... just Jason Momoa can't act. Jason Momoa <laughs> cannot act. And, like, that is just one thing I will always stand by. I do not care. I'm sorry to the Jason Momoa fans. I'm pretty sure he's... I've actually heard he's a very nice man. Um, Again, he's fun. I got, like, got to got meet that... him. Oh, yes. I remember yeah, so like, like the pictures. Yes. Yeah, so, like, the first time that I um got to do anything kind of cool after moving to L.A., it was like the... I'd only been here for, like, maybe a few weeks. The mm-hmm. uh, Aquaman like premiere was going on um across the street from my job <laughs> and i was like oh i can just go downstairs and go to that that's really cool and i went down there mm-hmm. and like he got out of the car so like where we were um all of the celebrities would get out of their car and then walk across the street to go to mm-hmm. the like blue carpet it was kind of a cool carpet that they had for the aquaman premiere and when he got dropped off instead of going straight to the carpet like some other celebrities did he just he came to the side where like the fans were and mm-hmm. met everyone, like walked up and down, um, wow. up and down to go and meet everyone. Came back down and met people, took pictures. He like he took my phone and took the picture for us. Uh, oh, he was wow. really, it was really See, and, and, that, and that's one thing I'll definitely give him. I remember on that press tour, he you could tell he was excited to be Alpha Man. He was having a lot of fun in the role, and so it's like I'm never gonna take that away. But he just can't. Um, and so, <laughs> and, I but to again, people say that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna give, okay, I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah, the body's on. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I appreciated that they really did at least try and give Arthur that story about, like you said, he was there in this place. He was just kind of hanging around, getting drunk all the time, not having any responsibilities. He lets Manta's dad die, which starts their whole feud and Manta coming at him for the entire of the movie. And it's when they finally get to Italy and after they have that big blowout that he kind of realizes that, like, oh, 
he even has a comment where he says, I've always just been used as a blunt instrument my, my whole life. And it's like, now I got to try and be something different. And I was like, yeah, man, like, this is what I'm talking about. This is the story. But I was just like, oh, you can't act. So it's not really hitting the way it should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, like, I was like, you know, when they would transition scenes and stuff, he would do like the voiceover for it. And it was very blatant. He was reading from a script. Yeah. Yeah. I just, Patrick Wilson would have been a really great. Aquaman. Yeah. He was a great Orm, though. He was he a like, he, he kind of carried the movie. <laughs> like, high key. Like, high key. Uh, and I was always fun, like, going back and watching their training scenes for that and, like, and the feature rights on the Blu ray and stuff like that um, uh, of just them. And again, like, you can tell everybody was having a good time and was just really excited to be a part of this movie. And, like, that's something I'm really looking forward to because this cast is actually really great. Y'all, y'all doing the team, Patrick Wilson, Willem Dafoe, Nicole Kidman. Okay. Um, Julie Andrews was the voice of the Karathan. Like, the, the, we're star-studded, baby. So it's going to be exciting to see all of them come back and just be together again and have a good time. Yeah, I hope that, like, the chemistry in this one is a little bit better than it was in the... The, in the first one, I'm sorry, hope the chemistry is better in the second than it was in this one. Um, because I'm shocked. kind of what was just lacking. I'm shocked um, Amber Heard is coming back, though. I'm gonna, it's going to hey. be interesting to see kind of like what her press tour is going to be like, I think. Yeah. And how big of a role they're going to give her. Because, like, she's Mara. Right. You, <laughs> you know, you, you can't, like, you can't you can't have Aquaman without Mera. Literally, any Aquaman run comic book run that does not have Mera, like people do not like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what um, they're gonna do with this now. Another thing I think this movie got really right was the trench. Oh yeah. Um, the entire scene actually there were, I mean, there were a couple of things the movie got right, if I'm being perfectly honest. Um, the Trench was one of the biggest ones, those for me. I remember, like, even watching the preview, I was like, dang, I wish this kind of just would have been a horror movie type of vibe with, like, the main villains being The Trench. Because that's actually a storyline in uh, John's Aquaman run. Like, that's what starts it out. The Trench are coming from the sea, and they're, like, kidnapping and eating people from Amnesty Bay. So he has to go and stop them. So I was like, ooh, I would love to see more of them. I thought the design of them was great. That scene of Mira and Arthur jumping off the boat into the water with the flare and the trencher just coming down after them, top five moment in any DC yeah. film. Yeah, that I was like, great. that was a hot moment right there. And like, I remember being in the theater all five times <laughs> and seeing that on this giant screen. And I was just like, man, this is Well, great. did you hear that that was going to be a plan? They were going to make a trench like horror movie? I did. I saw that there was supposed to be a spinoff, but it got canned. I'm it got canned. But yeah. you know, that's DC. They've talked about. Okay. Everybody How many slates we done seen? <laughs> <laughs> we done seen a few slates now. Um, so that was that. I also think the costuming team did fantastic. Yeah. All the Atlantean suits, the Atlanteans, just like when they were having the Coliseum fight to sing them around, the courts, the Fisherman Kingdom, everybody looked good. Everybody looked good. And the suits had a really nice mix of uh, kind of like tech. And you could tell maybe there was a little bit of mysticism, magic going in in some of them too. Um, but mixing like the scales into the designs. It was hot. I, I I actually really liked the way that they had the um, the aqua storm troopers. And mm -hmm. they had the water in their suits in their suits so they could breathe or mm -hmm. whatever. I thought that was really cool. Um, to be honest, the coolest thing for me in this movie mm -hmm. were the underwater scenes mm -hmm. because in my opinion like i can't think of another movie that like the majority of it took place underwater and it looked this good it looked and, good and not just where it was just you know a scene or two of two people looking at each other not saying anything and then they kind of swim away but like we're seeing them swimming and fighting and talking to each other and doing all the stuff underwater and it looked pretty good um i was very blown away by the way that they presented this movie honestly i <laughs> no shades was my girl <laughs> but <laughs> i remember walking out of the aquaman movie and thinking that the next time they have a captain marvel movie and she could fight in space mm -hmm. that they use this kind of technology that like with underwater because the way that it looked was great mm -hmm. i was like it was they, they, 
<laughs> that 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 final big battle of like all the kingdoms and the Karathan and just like when he calls all the sea life and marine creatures, I was just like, yeah, like this is this is feels good. Like this feels mm-hmm. like an Aquaman movie. Like and it looks good. And it was I remember I was very pleased walking out, watching it again. Yes, this is the movie that I want to see. Um, even from the first reveal of the suit, like. Everybody knows Aquaman has an orange scale male shirt and green pants. Yes. You don't think that's like, that's not the greatest colors to combine in real life. Um, And, you know, and I got on an orange shirt today. (laughs) 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 But, you know, and I think I said this before, but the original decision to make his costume, uh, those colors were because they're complementary colors in blue. And so the writers and creators of Aquaman were like, well, if he's going to be in the ocean, we need his costume to be something that stands out. And green and blue were those colors. And so, I mean, green and orange were those colors. So that's how he got that. I do appreciate that in the movie, they kind of made it more of a gold sheen than orange. I think it worked a little bit better. Um, But like, they nailed the reveal of the suit. Like when he walked out and he has it on and it's just like, yes. This looks That's one of good. Favorite, um, like superhero costume reveals. You know how every superhero movie they have the moment when they come out in their comic book oh, yeah. costume. Absolutely. Like Jason Momoa looked good in that suit. Like mm-hmm. walking out with like the water cascading off of him, tried it in hand. He looks powerful. He looks strong. It's like yes, this is the king of Atlantis. <laughs> this is the king of the seven seas, baby. Like, come on. And even I think Nicole Kidman, Nicole Kidman's line right after she's like, "Yes, the one true king." And I'm like, "Yes, yes, it is." I was like, "No him, no him." Um, That's right. So like, that was a really hot moment that I was pleased to see. Um, I also really enjoyed seeing a lot of the other kingdoms. The so in the Aquaman comics during the Johns run, he had kind of introduced this storyline called the uh, Rise of the Seven Seas where they were going to find the other kingdoms of Atlantis. This was back in, like, I want to say 2011, 2012, maybe, when this happened. He has never told that story. (laughs) And he would always... A funny story, that John's run was actually the first Aquaman run I ever picked up, and it made me a fan of him. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I highly recommend it. I'm not that big of a fan. I was like, I also thought that it was, like, it's Aquaman, whatever. But reading that run... I didn't read the whole run. I, I like picked up. I don't mm-hmm. know where I, I. I don't know where I stopped. It was well after Manta had the or like the Nemo and all that kind of stuff that was going on mm-hmm. in it. Oh, okay. So you stayed around for a while. Yeah, it was good. Like I. I yeah. I stayed, I stayed around. So, like I said, I'm always looking for like if you if a book can convince me that the character is cool, then I'm I'm gonna stick around. I tell people all the time. You know, obviously Aquaman has his reputation, but Aquaman has never actually had a bad comic book run. And like I'm speaking. There's one, Cullen Bunn wrote it, but that was a whole different story. Oh, and there's this other one from Kurt Busiek, but that also wasn't Aquaman that we know, so they, they don't count. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and I say this like completely objectively, like Aquaman has consistently had very well-received, critically and commercially, comic book runs. Um, very few things about He always has these really engaging stories. I've also come to realize I'm a person, I, I enjoy a little bit of politics in my story. I think that's another reason why I'm into like Captain Betsy very heavy. Like I love kind of like dealing with the people and the things that go in. I love political shows. Beep is amazing if you've never watched it. <laughs> um, but everything's really been good. So the Johns era, I feel like did a great job at kind of reminding people that Arthur is not a joke yes. or that he is a character to be taken seriously because again we know nobody was reading any of the old stuff so this is like for the new people who are just coming in like Johns was a very popular writer at the time everything he did was kind of good so it's like this is kind of coming and showing people like okay this is actually the Arthur that is consistently around in the comic books not what you've seen on the TVs or like the ones that have been made jokes of but it's funny because even though Johns did that and I consider him responsible for putting Arthur back on the map everyone who came onto the book after him wrote Arthur much better oh okay um I think Jeff Parker came on directly after him Cullen Bunn did Cullen Bunn was not a good run but also Mara wasn't in it so there was a lot of problems with that um, <laughs> 
then uh, Dan Abnett came on and did the Rebirth stuff. Kelly Sue DeConnick's run just ended not too long ago. Uh, all four of them, three of them, <laughs> they wrote a much more competent, like, well-rounded, engaging Arthur than Johns did. Johns was like a good blockbuster run. Like, puts him on the map, does the job, has great art throughout, some really big, engaging storylines. But when you get to, like, the character plus the action, and then the world building of Atlantis as a whole, that's everybody else after. John Parker did a really good job of doing Arthur's life on land. So he met like people from that Arthur went to high school with that he knew when he was kids. He gave him the dog, helped him really set up his house in the lighthouse. Uh, Abnett came in and really built up the politics of Atlantis and like introduced new characters on like the royal court and had Arthur dealing with being king on, uh, of the throne and then losing the throne and like being stuck down there and like the slums of Atlantis and meeting the poor people and stuff like that. And then you had Kelly Sue come in and she did a nice mix of both while also engaging Arthur in other cultures. So of course this was after the movie had come out. So they started tapping into that DCU synergy because Lord, what is the comic book gonna do if it doesn't match this movie synergy? <laughs> and so they had Arthur go and he met with these like uh, gods who were living, uh, they were like Polynesian gods and they ended up giving him some tattoos to mimic the ones in the movie as like, you know, and kind of immersing himself in that culture and then bringing those people back to Amnesty Bay and like having the people of Amnesty Bay deal with like these new cultures. It was, it's a really good one. Like Aquaman has never, Aquaman has never had a bad comic book. The Sub Diego, and I always tell people, if you can go back and read the Will Pfeiffer run that introduced Sub Diego when San Francisco sunk to the bottom of the ocean and then like uh, Arthur takes kind of, mayor of that town and we meet Lorena who was off at the time like it's some good stuff in there people mm-hmm. it's a it lot of good stuff. some some solid stuff I've never heard of any of the Aquaman runs being bad it just always felt like people just gave him a bad rep because he's Aquaman and you talk and to he talks to fit, which is like what's more what do you want the world's about to be underwater of course you want to talk to <laughs> him. <laughs> it's very fair solid point like you guys better learn to swim. Now, did you like the... Did they change this in the movie compared to the comics as far as his mom and his dad? I thought that his dad died. His dad did die. Okay. Um, in his, the mom, comic his mom... Comic his mom died too, right? She's still alive. So when they did... So she actually pops up in the Jeff Parker run. So... Um, how does that happen? I don't really... I gotta have to go back and read it. But basically, Arthur goes on this mission, he comes into contact with Gorilla Grodd and like the city where all those apes live and they find out that Atlantis and the the monkeys are connected. That the monkeys actually used to like work, they were kind of slaves. Um, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> they were okay. kind of slaves, to, they were kind of slaves to the Atlanteans. Um, but they broke free and they came to a place of peace somewhat but they had all these like teleportation uh, nodules that they used to go back and forth. And so Arthur gets into one and it transports him to the place where his mom actually is, That she, which is kind of like, how, so how she was living in this other kingdom in the movie, she that's how it is in the uh, comic. Oh, that's cool. But like, I always thought she died. Yeah, but in the comic, there's actually like other people there. And so there was supposed to be a thing that I think he was gonna try and connect it to Garth because the, some of the people that she had, they called them purple eyes. And they oh, like, yes, Garth. and you know, Garth has the purple eyes, but they could like see flashes of uh, the future and things like that. And so she kind of ruled these people. And so she actually, but she sent Arthur away. So we haven't seen her since, but she is still alive. Okay, but she's just like living in this other uh, dimension, place, whatever. Yeah. Very, she's got, she's, it's like, it's, there's dinosaurs and stuff there. She's got on like this bone armor. She's hot. She got like this long gray ponytail. She carries her own little Quindant. She's I don't know. Up. I wonder if that's like, uh, does she look like the movie version of that? Like, was it close to that? Like, She's a little like, bit more uh, savage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I always thought she died. <laughs> She's still around the kicking. She's still around the kicking, but that's cool. Oh, I, I literally thought that that was a retcon that they changed in the movie, like to give him like a happy ending with his parents. But I, I guess so. that. And the, well, I mean, the, the parents' happy ending is the right con. <laughs> 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 but 
That's very like that is very much dead, which makes me think they actually might kill him in the sequel. Mm. Or just probably maybe not bring him back or say he yeah. died like in between movies. Something like that. Um, there's supposed yeah. to be like a little HBO Max is supposed to have a little three episode animated series, which is basically supposed to tie into the movie, and it's going to be the time in between um, the ending of the first one and the sequel. Oh, cool. I've seen the stuff for that Aquaman TV series, but I thought that was just like a little cartoon. I didn't know it was going to like connect to the movie. Yeah, no, it's definitely going to be, it's canon to the movie. So I'm actually really excited about that because I like his design and that. He's got short blue hair. That's cool. Did you like all of the um, like action stuff in this movie or are you looking forward to something in the next oh. one? Yeah, no, most definitely. I enjoyed all of it. Like, and again, going back and watching it this time and seeing how, like, getting excited all over again, I was like, oh, this is really good. Like you said, the Italy scene, Mira running across the rooftops and then using the wine as weapons, and then Manta and Arthur and him blasting him in the arms. Like, Manta looked great. Manta was great in this movie. Um, yeah. He felt deadly. He felt ominous. I love that by the end, he's still very much on his I'm coming to get Arthur because really, Black Manta doesn't do anything else in the comic books but come to kill Arthur. So, like, that <laughs> felt very on point. Um, Dr. Shen, I forgot, was Randall Park. Yeah, I, shout out to uh, Jimmy Woo. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, he's really been in everything. Um, so, I'm excited. I hope he comes back for the sequel also because that'll be nice to see. Dr. Shen also has a very big part in Aquaman's life where he is, in the comics, he's the one who kind of revealed that Arthur and Atlantis exist. Because he's been like... He, like, obsessed with him, right? Or, like, that whole culture. Yeah, very much so. Um, I think he's dead now, though. I'm pretty sure he died. But, nonetheless, I hope everyone comes back today. Anything you're looking forward to, and to see? Anything from the comics you want to see in Aquaman 2? Yes, Grant, but... Grant, I, I understand taking it with a grain of salt because um, a friend of mine brought up how they wanted uh, uh, what was Homeboy that made that played Chiron in uh, in uh, Moonlight? I can't think of the actor's name. Oh, um... Cervantes. Right. So I wanted him to be Jon Stewart, but a friend of mine was like, do you even want to subject him to the DCEU? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> good, yeah. good point. So I, I mean, understand that, like, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt good to us. But I, I think for me... Yeah, I think for me and Aquaman, I, there's a lot that I want to see, but I don't... So I think my biggest issue with the first movie, especially the first time I watched it, with that I felt like they tried to put too much into it. Like they very much tried to make it like an origin movie and uh, the sequel and the finale all in one. Like we could have spaced some things out or we could have just cut out the entire scene of like him training with Volko when he was younger with the kids because that that stuff was not good. Um, the face looks real but, wonky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, thing, the things I kind of want to see in the sequel I don't think they're going to happen just yet because I feel like they're too far out. One thing I would really love, obviously, I want to see Aqualad, Calder, and oh, there. Sure. Um, I really would love to see them adapt the Sub Diego storyline where San Diego sinks to the bottom of the ocean and he kind of like takes over those people. But at the same time, to do that, he has to be ousted from Atlantis. And we haven't really seen him in Atlantis yet for him to be ousted. So that feels more like something that will happen in the third movie or so. Even like Jackson also, I feel like he could get introduced in this one, but I don't feel like he's not going to come into the third one. Um, but then I also think about myself and like the actors who are in this, do I want them to be on a three-peat? Or am I ready for them to just reboot in the Baddison universe when that comes out? Mm. I mean, pro that's probably what you would prefer, I think. I, think I mean, so. although I, I don't know if they're trying to make the Baddison thing a whole universe. I don't know what they're doing there. I mean, I know they, I know they've kind of said that they're doing like the multiverse thing. They, they, they just fully accepted like that's what they're calling. Just do it what you want. <laughs> do, do what you want. So, um, I wouldn't be opposed like if we just rebooted Aquaman all together and it was a, another new universe. Like I'm okay with that as well. Sure. Uh, but those are some of the things I want to see. I do want to see the trench come back. I would love to see Black Manta, if he's going to keep kind of getting a prominent role like Nemo. Uh, there's a few other Aquaman villains I would love to see. Scavenger, Deep Water, is this, like kind of chimera type of creature who can uh, try teleport itself through water and takes people over. Um, 
that would be nice. There's a lot. There's a, there's a lot there. Lady of the Lake, if we kind of want to get to the magic stuff. I do not want him to lose his hand. I never want to see the hook hand. Ever. Ever. I don't know. People people like that. So I, you I, might you might get I a... I do not want to see the hook hand. <laughs> Let us leave the 90s in the past. I do not <laughs> ever want to see a hook hand. It's not even exciting. It's a hook. People for a like hand. It. For some reason, Aquaman, they love that hook hand. It's like, it's like Storm's going? mohawk. It's like how he gonna hold it go. It's like Storm's Mohawk. Oh my god. How is he gonna hold a trident? <laughs> That's what his other hand is for. He's not left handed. <laughs> <laughs> what do y'all mean? They love um, it. I don't. I think it looks silly, but it is what it's it is. so silly. It's such it's such an old relic. And and, and again, I, and so I think this is the thing for like the pad run is another one of those Aquaman runs that is like so well regarded that that's why because he's the one who did the uh, hook hand, but again, Aquaman has all had a lot of really good runs. But the writers of the last decade have probably been the best Aquaman writers in quite a while. Did you like? And, it? and so it's yeah. I mean, it was again, it was fine for its time. Like I think, but for me, it was never my favorite. I think it was a well written run, but I think what it did, it tried to make Arthur Namor. And Arthur and Namor are not the same person. Mm-hmm. So it's like he's very aggressive, he's very bodacious, and it's like, like, okay, it's fine. Again, I get what you're trying to do for this character, and it's like, it's an enjoyable run, but it's like, this isn't Arthur at his core. This is like someone putting on. So that's fine. Mm-hmm. It don't get talked about no more. <laughs> we don't. They only mention that hook. They try to bring up that okay. hook, but... And that's all, and that's all you can ever remember from it. And that's the thing. It's like, no, we've moved on. We've moved on. We're happy. Now. Let it go. Arthur's about to settle down. His daughter is here. Um, his I like wife her. is out of her coma. They have dissolved the monarchies. He can chill. Jackson is going to become Aquaman soon. Mm-hmm. We're in a good space. And it just seems like a hot spot right now. It is. Come on down to the sea, guys. We're going. to... Go even lower than the street right now. <laughs> <laughs> Take a dip in the water. <laughs> Take a dip in the water. But um, yeah, so that was Aquaman. You guys, be sure to tweet us. Let us know your thoughts about the movie. What you expect to see from the sequel. What you hope to see from the sequel. If you want Jason Moa to return. If you have someone else who you would like to be cast or who you think could be a great Aquaman, I'm always down to listen to someone's casting. Yo, you don't change that casting. You. <laughs> you know, let me tell you. To the point of me being in the theater like five minutes before the movie started, I was sitting there like. Maybe this isn't true. <laughs> like somebody else was going to be Aquaman in the movie like, that you paid for. <laughs> like the credits were rolling. I mean, not the credits. Like, yeah, the opening credits were rolling. Like we were starting. And I'm just like, it just, it's just not feel. And this is why I tell you, this is why I'm telling you, I think you need to prepare for Civil War too, Because mm-hmm. it's Carol's event. And I remember pushing back that Aquaman casting and that news for so long and dealing with that. And having that reaction afterwards, I'm just gonna be like, mm, if you come to terms with it now, it's gonna be great. No, I, luckily enough for me, I don't have to worry about that <laughs> because <laughs> I doubt that they'll ever do a Civil War two. Um, They're definitely doing Civil War two. It's Carol's event. Okay. There's no. You iron- want the Ultimates, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, the Ultimates are only known for like two things: going to space mm-hmm. and being a part of Civil War two. Do people even know them for that part? I feel like they mostly just know them for the space. Because they're Carol's team. They were with Carol when it happened. They help her find... Oh, it's her team now? I mean, it is. Is that what you call it? So Blue Marvel is underneath her? Is that how you feel? I mean, on that team, yes. That was Carol's <laughs> team. Unfortunately. It's, because it's Carol's event. <laughs> it's, it's that. <laughs> it is. <laughs> and I just... I just convince really yourself. Want she to hasn't had one yet, actually. She hasn't had one since. Well, she was. Well, she's been like prominent in a few. She did a bunch of stuff in the Brood Saga. She did a bunch of stuff in um, yeah. well, in Korvac Saga. I think like, the at the question. end, at the end, the president like specifically congratulated her on her win and told her how she could be the first superhero president. You she, read like, it? to the of end. Of course, I read it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I did. I didn't. <laughs> oh my gosh! Of course I read it. What? Absolutely not. Why would I want yeah. to read that? Oh, you should read it. Uh, no. She won. It's her event. <laughs> if you say so, you would know because you spent the money on it and read it. I wouldn't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I didn't do. It. I'm not doing all that. Um, all right, y'all. So that brings us to <laughs> the end of the show. Make sure you guys check us out on uh, Twitter. You can find us at Another Relaunch. You can send us any of your uh, questions, comments to Another Relaunch at gmail.com. You can find us on YouTube if you want to chill out and watch us on there at on YouTube, Another Relaunch TV. Uh, you can find me on social media at Uncanny LZ on most uh, platforms. Keenan, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Keenan Lance. You know there is an underscore at the end. And if you play Outriders on Xbox, please let me know. Let's trade gamer tags so we can play. Because I need some people to play with. Okay. Yes, y'all. Start gaming with us. So, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm.